and apart from that the dynamic group will definitely uh, bring some kind of biasness in terms of uh, experience ego and what kind of that person is so this is the understanding we got from this topic and uh, definitely uh, we will be looking forward to understand more because this topic itself is a very vast and will give a more platform to understand things thank you so much thank you satyam uh, very well said uh, we request group number 5 to go ahead and present their thoughts uh, group number 5 give a big round of applause to harsh so our question was how organization can upskill their employees at a rapid pace so as a group we came up with a solution like it is an answer for it is a talent management and learning and development so first the one is succession planning with the help of succession planning the managers can uh, ask their employees uh, well, to check whether they are skillful or not to, to promote them to the next level second is cross cultural and cross functional training it is a very good uh, answer for uh, checking on the differences if there are difference between a culture in the team then training can be provided for that third one is linking learning with the your kpis every employee has a kpi so if we uh, include learning in that then it will be beneficial uh, in future for promoting them uh, next one is individual development plan with the involvement of the seniors uh, uh, with the involvement of seniors into the uh, function so seniors can play a role uh, they will check whether the uh, the employees are, are working uh, as per the individual plan or not thank you Thank you, Harsh. Could we have group number six presenting their thoughts? Group six, Manan, could you? so our topic for uh, group number 6 was to how to inculcate good culture practices from another culture into our own so we br uh, brainstormed a little uh, discuss some ideas and then we jotted down few points as a summarize uh, first of all we need to respect all the cultures that are all around with us we need to explore those cultures and then uh, the other thing then we, uh, that we discuss is we need to increase our zone of tolerance We are, there are times when we are intolerant about other, uh, other cultures. We do not. We treat our own cultures as above uh, in respect to other cultures, and then we need to listen and absorb uh, the, and inculcate the values that are there in other cultures. Uh, we need to ask questions, take a stand. Uh, we need to see what is right, what is wrong, and then we need to move forward with that. Uh, and uh, further will be explained by Shikhuj. so what we also have to do is to let go of my culture is the best culture others have good practice also so we have to respect them and respect their cultures also to synergize and collaborate we need to you know look the common things and uh, for the common cause we have to get everything for the culture so next with the resonate with their stories other would be the while traveling we have to local family and also the other cultures and look forward to it and also what i want to say is uh, more cultural exchange programs what we have in soil is uh, like should be done more and more in the education purposes because it's very important that education needs to be done and it needs to be done holistically and the cultural exchange should be included as a subject for many of the b schools and other schools thank you Thank you, Manan and Shitej. Last but not the least, Group Seven, you have the stage. Hello. So our topic was what institutions and societies can do to increase women representation at leadership level. Uh, let me start with a fact. According to World Economic Forum's 2022 Global Gender Gap Report, only 37 percent of women are represented in uh, leadership roles overall. So, when we brainstorm on this, we as a group, uh, like we discussed, that resignations um, are alone not enough because, as we see in uh, panchayat levels, we do have 
but over there also the husbands uh, they end up taking decisions and we have not been able to implement them at the lok sabha level as well so what we thought that the reason behind this is mostly if we want to bring in change it should start from the home uh, from the childhood level what women uh, observe is that they are given a secondary position and they are not encouraged to take decisions maybe it related to finance or any other decision so uh, i would like to share uh, what institutions can do to empower uh, women so uh, la last last week vedanta group chro had uh, visited uh, our campus and he uh, shared with us that uh, what what kind of program they have for this so they have a, se a separate program for uh, women empower uh, women empowerment for leadership level in that they uh, they found out that at the like they observed in their survey that in the uh, middle like when women reach in the middle uh, positions they drop off so the reasons that they found out was they adjust to what like their husbands are doing and they themselves don't take up the leadership position so they as a vedanta group they provided all the resources that they could so that so that women themselves could take the leadership positions and on an individual level as well women should uh, take charge and be a role model for the coming generations only then the change will happen thank you thank you everyone i'm sure this exercise has enabled us to introspect and we we'll probably take the solutions forward It has been an absolute privilege to learn from our respected industry leaders about topics that have such a significant impact on our lives. I am confident that the students will remember and apply what they have learned in their professional lives. Absolutely, Shweta. What a wonderful day it has been so far. Keeping up the spirit, I am delighted to introduce the topic for this session: social metamorphosis, drivers, challenges, and opportunities. We invite our colleague, Ms. Rutuja Pillai, at Soy, to give a brief introduction on the topic. Yes, please give a round of applause to Rutuja. Good afternoon, everyone. so uh, i would like to start with a quote of aristotle when the uh, when when the storytelling goes bad in a society that is is decadent what he means by this is society brings forth holistic experience a sense of security an institution in which one feels warm with a deep sense of belonging but in the but if the shared mindsets are not thinking enough for progressive growth it leads to overall social depression in the last two decades from the advent of buka word there is an ongoing phenomenon of social evolution encompassing social change social justice community development civic dialogue cultural strength etc which has both a positive and a negative connotation to it the so called society today is far away from the consciousness of being the perception of humanity and the realization of self we all are running endlessly living behind the essence of our nature and the essence of togetherness this change is further accelerated during the post uh, during and post pandemic there are many factors that are driving this metamorphosis global technological advancement is revol is revolutionizing every aspect of life social media has changed the game from establishing direct marketing channels to young adults building lucrative careers india has uh, one of the largest workforce in the world but lags behind in important skills to its workforce the india skills 2020 uh, report found that only about 45.9% of young people would be considered employable there is also a cultural change that in the thought processes of how we see families and relationships from joint families to living dating apps or digital friendships to omega 
generation generation z and alpha are over over ambitious they endeavor to acquire skills knowledge and money in half the time as their earlier generation by working for longer hours to moonlighting and other this is one of the many reasons that they fall prey to psychological issues like anxiety and depression work dynamics are also changing with these intergenerational changes the way we look at our health has changed which is great but especially post pandemic we have taken a preventive approach than a treatment with uh, treatment approach at the time when good physique is the new cool young adults are hitting the gyms more often than ever leading to over, over stre uh, stressing and even heart attack drug alcohol and cigarette abuse is no more a taboo hitting the clubs on the weekend after stressful week is a new normal we and uh, we indian are falling prey to cultural imperialism and becoming an economy of consumers rather than contributors and this list is not exhaustive gig economy uh, hybrid working great resignation re reshuffling moonlighting career cushioning gdp is uh, increasing but so is the economic inequality these are the new buzzwords in these times of uncertainty it is time to question how we would like to move ahead from them to build or create a society we need to now start thinking at the grassroots level a society with intellect and emotional intelligence as its strength would never fail and therefore a and therefore to build a healthy society we all including government ngos corporates societies and citizens need to look need to first look at collective consciousness as the first step towards metamorphosis and uh, with this i now set the stage for our distinguished speakers to further throw light on this topic thank you thank you roshan pratija that was indeed informative we are honored to welcome our steam panelists joining us today mr rohit adlaka the former chief digital and information officer and global head of the proforms mr adlaka was at the forefront of the pros digital transformation journey where his core focus lay in creating end user delight strengthening digital security and trust monetizing ips and building a culture that fosters innovation leading the proforms artificial intelligence platform and automation ecosystem mr adlaka was driving the new paradigm of economics efficiency and experience as the leader of wipro's most transformative team he had tried to reimagine and execute their digital strategies overcome internal and cultural challenges and make ai and automation all pervasive he has 25 years of diversified experience and over the years held key positions across sales solutioning delivery and pnl management he has mentored many technology startups such as vasara india accelerator data neuron and vector center from securing full so securing seed funding to scaling them as unicorns we request you to join us on stage and also like to welcome you sir I so I also request Dr. Vijaya Ma'am to please come on stage and please state Mr. Adlaka. Give a round of applause to Vijaya Ma'am as well. We are also very happy to welcome Mr. Peter David Pedersen, who has joined us virtually from Japan from our partner university, the Shizuoka University. Mr. Pedersen joined Meiji Holdings Company Limited's board of directors as an outside director in 2022. He has been providing the company with advice on sustainable management while serving as an outside expert on its ESG. Following his graduation from Copenhagen University in 1995. He returned to Japan and launched his career, focusing on best practices for integrating ecological concerns in corporate management. 
He reorganized international symposiums and provided consulting to small and medium-sized companies. In 2000, he jointly established eSquare Inc., a consultancy firm specializing in environmental sustainability and CSR. Mr. Pedersen has also co-founded Nest Leaders Initiative for Sustainability in 2015 and currently serves as its representative director. He is also a professor at Chizenkin University, where he teaches sustainability and innovation. We thank you for joining us virtually, sir, and welcome you. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. You want me to say anything now or not? I guess later, right? It also gives us immense pleasure to welcome Mr. Yogesh Andle from our soil family, who will be also be acting as a moderator for the session. Mr. Andle, an entrepreneur and serving as the managing director of Nucleus Software. He was part of founding team of several leading well-known companies in IT, consultancy and education field. Sir graduated from IIT Delhi in 1979 and was president of IIT Delhi Alumni Association during the year 2006 and 7. He has been an active participant in PAN IIT alumni activities and was chair of exhibition committee for PAN IIT Conclave 2010. During his career, he has also served as member of the board of directors of Critical Solutions, Wheels Charitable Foundation and at Soy. Mr. Arne has co-founded AIM Square Inclusion, Inclusive Innovation in the new normal in 2020. He has been mentor to several IT startups and inspiration to many youngsters. He has been actively participating in several community activities to create an impact in the society. Welcome, you, sir. We also request uh, AM Bhattacharya, sir, to please felicitate Mr. Yogi Shardley, sir. Thank you. From now forward, uh, Mr. Yogi sir will take the session forward. I would hand over. Good afternoon, everyone. This topic of social metamorphosis is something which, let me be very frank with you, I did not understand when I was at your age. All that I understood at that point of time was how to build systems, how to understand user requirements, how to program, how to deliver. But over a period of time, when I reflect back, I realize that there's so much of change that was happening because of all those systems that we developed and delivered. Today, almost 75% of consumer loans, be it house loan, be it auto loans, be it consumer durable loans, are processed through products and systems that have been developed by Nucleus. Today, the Reserve Bank of India, the entire accounting, the ledger, the entire reporting system is run on system developed by Intellect Design. And we see the kind of difference that it is making all around us. There was a time when RBI governor would you know, would not get reports on what the status is of the economy of the banks of banking sector for weeks because the, the, these need to be collected from banks, compiled and presented. Today, at the click of the button, we can see what is the status, which bank is holding, how much money, how much liquidity, how much is getting transferred, how much is being moved. Everything is available at the fingertips. And do you suddenly so realize the difference that all this has made the first time when we mentored a startup that was called eco eko if some of you have seen it 
eco introduced a mechanism by which banking funds transfer could be done at the doorstep of the customer a person in his locality a laborer could walk to a kirana store, store next door give 1000 rupees to be delivered to his family somewhere in remote bihar or eastern up and the money would get transferred because his family would go to the local kirana store there to take that 1000 rupees now imagine the kind of change it brought about in the society suddenly we were not far away from each other the technology has created it's it's completely compressed the world into our single screen when we go around different villages today when we uh, go to several we we come across many artisans who are selling their wares directly on whatsapp they are selling their wares on uh, facebook and they are getting customers from all over the place the positives also come with certain negatives before we go into those all those details debates i want to invite rohit to share his perspective on what how the digital transformation the ais and mls are changing and impacting this space rohit i think it's going to be a fantastic presentation we are going to sit downstairs we are not going to occupy the stage here so over to you rohit thank you the session is going to be organized like this rohit is going to make a presentation presentation for about next 20 25 minutes and then we'll invite peter uh, sand to make his remarks and we'll open it then to the house we'll have a lot of questions i hope just be ready with your questions because this is this is a very very exciting session very high energy and high enthusiasm right roy take care. thank you hi everyone everyone's awake gulab jamun sapne kha liye pakka okay how many of your mobile phones Where are the phones? Silent भी किस-किस के हैं? शाबाश. My name is Rohit, and I thought it's more appropriate to keep myself awake, keep all of you awake by coming into the audience. And uh, those of you who are not very good with names, my second name is Adlaka, which literally means fifty thousand. तो अगर नाम भूल जाओ तो याद रखना मैं richest guy who came and you know talked to us out here. In some sense. Uh, I belong to Delhi because I was born in Delhi. I started my schooling in Delhi. I finished my schooling in Delhi, and then I did my college also in Delhi, and I joined Uttar also in Delhi. So a lot of Delhi associations, uh, and I live in two states because my parents are in Noida, UP, and my in-laws are in Gurgaon, Vatican City. So two states. I spent about twenty-six uh, years in a company called Vitro. If you are all familiar, we have a Vitroy already here. Why don't you stand up and say hi to everyone? Sort of me. That's sort of his part of Vitro. I ragged him when I came to know he's in Vitro. And first I joined. Uh, first I finished my stint in Vitro. I had the spring of two thousand twenty. I have now become an independent advisor to multiple companies, focusing on deep tech, AI, cyber risk, and security. Collaboration, so you name it. That's what I focus on. So the next thirty to thirty-five minutes, if I may request all of you to keep it interactive, because I'll keep asking questions here itself, so that everyone is up and awake. Hi, what's your name? Askar. Askar, the question: How many guys? Askar, first question will come to you. So be be upright. So the presentation has been three parts. Part one is the disruption happening all around us. Part two, I'll take one topic which is much in the news for the last five to ten years. And third is for us students. And when I say us students, means I am also a student because I am in constant learning. What is it that we can embrace and guide this transformation evolution which is happening all around us? So we are in what we call the fourth industrial revolution. the first happened around 18th century second happened 19th century when electricity came 
Third happened 20th century when computers and so-called digital age came. And the fourth industrial revolution that we are in, in the 21st century, which is all about AI. Artificial intelligence and metaverse and brain uh, human augmentation, you name it. That's what the fourth industrial revolution is all about. And what it does is it brings three worlds together. Physically, we are physically here. I hope mentally also here in the room. Second is the virtual world. And the third is the biological world. Because we have smart watches. We have SpO2 meters at home. We have bands which will measure temperature. So the biological world, the physical world, and the virtual worlds are coming together to channelize the 21st century. And life has become all about impatience. No one is willing to wait for Netflix to download a movie for months, in seconds. And that's what the promise of 5G is all about. So let's do some pop quiz. Where's Vatska, my friend? All set, just? Okay. Let's first see what are the disruptions happening all around us. And I'm not sure what graph is visible to you, but I'll some very, very interesting facts. It talks about what happens in one internet minute in this digital age. So in one minute, how many of us use WhatsApp here? Everyone? So any guesses how many WhatsApp messages sent globally in one minute? Anyone? Bhaskar, up to the favorite way of us. In one minute. 10,000. Why are you saying that you 10,000? Sorry? 1 trillion. My God. What's your name? Do you attend classes or only WhatsApp messaging? <laughs> so, 44 million messages on WhatsApp are sent in every minute. I know Peter is on and we'll keep slightly branching off into Hindi just to make the, you know, atmosphere a little jovial, but we'll switch back to English as much as possible. Okay. How many of you watch Netflix? Who did not raise their hands? Now you raise your hands. Who doesn't watch Netflix? What are you talking about? What's your name? Yash Raj. Yash Raj. He makes sense on his own. <laughs> so in one minute, there are 440,000 hours. 440,000 hours of Netflix streaming that happens globally. Okay. How many do you use Google search? 5.7 million Google searches happen in one internet minute. 5.7 million. And who do shopping on Amazon? No brainer. 383,000 worth of merchandise or e-commerce shopping is done in one minute globally. So that's the power of this digital age. What are the disruptions happening all around us? Okay. Let me ask the ladies here. Every human being generates how much data in one minute? What you eat, what you speak, what you put up on Facebook, what you put up on Twitter, Instagram, Snap. Imagine how much data goes from one human being in one minute. One billion. One million. Okay, one million what? Huh? You need a point of the paper. 102 MB. What's your name? Mitesh Bada Gyani Admi Lakta Mahi. Sayy? 102 MB of data every human being generates in one internet minute. Okay. So you can well imagine how much data is all around us. Yeah. Slide down. Okay. I'll go through the rest of the slides till they come up. So, how many MB of data for one minute? As you tell us, are extremely enthusiastic on what we post on the social media. 
the other disruption is that there are close to, I think now we've crossed 8 billion people on this planet. And there are close to 6 billion people who have mobile phones and 6 billion people who surf the internet. And very interestingly, GDP is about anywhere between 80 to 85 right now. And the companies whose market cap or market value is more than the GDP of countries. So, to take a shot, which is the most valuable company in terms of market cap currently? And what's our market cap? Three billion. Okay, any other figures? 1.3, excellent. Anyone from this table? Lagao, lagao, guess lagao. Roughly 2.3 trillion. And very interestingly, the stock has shot up about 40%, whereas all its friends, Meta, Amazon, Tesla, you know, earlier part of what we used to call the Kafa League, and Alphabet, the combined market cap of these four companies is lesser than that of Apple. So imagine if a company is $2.3 trillion in worth, it is bigger than countries in terms of economies. And what started as a company building the math machines, how many of you Apple user here? Anyone with Apple 14 books? No one? No? Huh? Are we 13 playing? Mm -hmm. So if you look at Apple, started off with a Mac machine, moved into laptops, moved into mobile phones. And now Apple has got Apple payments, Apple has got Apple music. So these companies these are going from a single front line to be economies of their own. Look at Alphabet. Very famous for Google, Google Search, Google Workspace, Google Mail. But they have healthcare. They have autonomous cars. Friends in Amazon, they bought food foods. So e-commerce, books, home foods, and now Amazon Alexa. I don't know if you have Alexa also, disappointingly. They shut down their education business. They shut down the distribution business. And now third is Alexa is shutting down. But the fact is that technology is disrupting everything around some companies are becoming more powerful than countries themselves. The second shift, I hope this slide is a little more readable. But let's look at what are the disruptions happening ahead of us? What's coming? How many people use energy? 5G, fifth generation, is there in Bali now? Yeah, they say to Allah, Vietnam, what I got those. No, it's okay. So, 5G is now giving you speeds 40 times higher than 4G. 40 GBPS upload and 40 GBPS uh, download. So, you can now download your favorite movies in seconds. <laughs> The second big disruption is this internet of behaviors. And I'll come back when I'm telling you all of these because it's important to circle back on the disruptions, the societal changes, and what we need to do as humans. If you look at internet of behaviors, everything that we do literally is there on social media or somewhere on the dark web. We may not realize that. How much we sleep, tracked by our phone, what we eat. We basically put where are we shopping, where are we going to the next pub, everything. And there are companies that know 80% or more about you, that is more than your parents themselves or your siblings. So people are using your behavior, people are using your checking your movement to predict what you should do. And in some sense, we already are doing that. Right? When you go to Swiggy, they'll suggest a restaurant based on your cuisine that you or palate that you have. You go onto Facebook, and this used to happen many years back. Our friend used to get tagged in terms of the names. You go on to make my trip, and then that pop-up comes into Facebook. So your internet of behaviors is becoming very strong. So like this, there are multiple disruptions. And I'll pick up one more from uh, a gentleman called Elon Musk, who's much in the news nowadays for multiple reasons. So Elon Musk, of course, had PayPal, Tesla, 
and uh, SpaceX, Starlink, Twitter, and of course, a very interesting company called Neuralink. And Neuralink is helping people in terms of brain augmentation. The brain can hold about 2.5 petabyte of information. And people are now replicating it and making a digital twin of it. In fact, on a lighter note, people are making a digital twin of planet Earth itself. And it's called Destiny by European Space Agency. Track it 2030, a full digital twin of planet Earth will be made available. So there are so many disruptions happening. And what is the underlying common denominator? Artificial intelligence. And if you look at AI, Roughly 500 billion worth of investments will go in terms of research and product development, but it will end up impacting 15 trillion dollars of the economy by 2030. And we don't realize it, but bots or robots are all around us. 50% of the traffic generated on the internet is through bots, and 50% of them are malicious bots, which we again don't realize. Say, so, yeah. having said that, Every technology has a flip side. There is a positive impact and there is a potential negative impact also. And there are a lot of concerns around AI. The first one is that AI will disrupt human beings, human lives, living of people, and it will displace jobs. So by 2022 end, where we are almost there, while 133 new jobs will get created, 75 million jobs will get displaced. So with every technology like AI, people will first come back and say, we need to start in terms of ethics, in terms of transparency, in terms of auditability, and then we'll come to the positive aspect of it. The biggest threat, and I don't know how many of you watch movies, uh, you've seen the movie Terminator? Terminator 2? It's called the Judgment Day. Have you seen this movie of Will Smith called I don't know. Very good. Interstellar. Buddy picture the picture. In all the means, the common thread is that how robots or machines will become smarter than humans. And the year to be predicted is 2030, where machines will become smarter than humans. And I've just put up a LinkedIn post today. I don't know how many of you heard of this company called OpenAI? Again, and something called Chat GPT. It's supposed to be the most advanced NLP natural language processing engine. When you speak to it or you write to it, and it will generate content for you. Just like DALI, D A L L E, builds images for you. Chat GPT can build a story, can do the homework assignment, and write code also, and it can create stories. Man. I just sent a spook to it, say, tell me how my college life is about. And it built a full poem for him. He put it on my WhatsApp chat uh, yesterday. So imagine the kind of technology and so called singularity where machines are becoming smarter and more learning, whereas humans are becoming more machine. Oh. Having seen this, what is it that governments are doing to manage this disruption? And I'll pick up one of advanced countries, Singapore, small country, but one of the most advanced. And Singapore is built something called a Singapore brain, which manages and monitors the entire country. Animals, epidemics, traffic, human movement, it controls and manages the entire society environment itself. And they are bringing students, they are bringing companies, they are bringing other companies, environment and jointly ideate and innovate on what AI should be. Same is the case with UK. UK has already spent about 2.4 billion in the last eight years on AI. And India can't be far behind. Where in 2018, India launched its own AI for all strategy. And is focusing on healthcare, education, smart cities, smart mobility, and agriculture. So disruptions are there, companies are investing, companies are investing, 
what is it for all of us now when interesting me at least during our time there were two streams actually three science arts and commerce and profession were either engineering or medicine and now there are hundreds of careers possible but look at the new career opportunities for all of you who are embarking on their career journeys or will be launching this soon i have again taken the example of ai as to what are the kind of professions or career streams that you can choose so you can become a product designer which will tell you why we do something you can become a data scientist which is much in the news to tell you what to do or become a data engineer as to how to do it and those who want to study hr those who want to study law there is opportunity in terms of career for you also so big disruptions big change in thought process big change in mindset okay i think i will switch over to the third part of my slide deck what is it that we should do as humans what is it that we should do as individuals what is it that we should do as students the solution from my side is that keep your learning curve on throughout your life people must have told you think good pass kar lo life ban jayegi then people must have said think cross country that's it last hurdle in life then entrance exam then college then mba then working then every promotion then marriage then kids at every stage there is some disruptive input coming to you that this is the last and then you will plateau but the fact is that once you get you are born and till you pass away from this physical world you are always learning so keep your learning always on keep your innovation always on all the people who talk about a 20 year generation gap in my view is come down to 5 years and very soon it will become 1 or 2 years classical example i met students of third year engineering about a few weeks back don't talk process versus a son who is in grade 12 versus a daughter who is in grade 5 there is an absolute marked difference in their interest on the music they listen to and the games that they play so the generation gap is shrinking and if you are outdated from this market within a span of 2 to 3 months you can be outpaced so make sure you are always on the hook here are some examples of of innovation but the fact is that the economy of the world the 85 trillion that i talked about will double by 2050 and 85% of that economic growth will be powered by technology innovation so you are sitting in hot seat you are in the right path you are in the right time you are in the right place to make an impact on society there is a big debate going on should i join the corporate world or should i start a startup of my own or should i join a startup itself so i thought whether you join a big company or join a startup that entrepreneurial culture should always be there with you and let me again come back to a few questions and i'll this time go to the last two or three how many startups are there in india what's your name sir arshi batai near about 5 Five thousand startups. Anyone else, sir? Ten, fifteen, twelve. Three months are there. Run. Or a little bit more. Thirty-five thousand. Anyone else? Higher bit. Let's show us. Go for them. Huh? Ah, here they come. Many more. Okay. Okay. So last count when they did when I did this was around June time frame of this year, seventy three thousand startups in India. In terms of ranking of startups, which means the startup ecosystems, where does India stand amongst all countries? Top five, good guess. Specific. Second. Third, okay, move number one. 
was number two. India is number three. The combined valuation of Indian startups is about four hundred and fifty billion dollars. But someone talked about diversity in one of the groups just now. Any guesses in startups? How many ladies are there in the leadership positions? Any guesses? Eighty percent. Hey, Shabash. Anyone else? Eighty percent. Running. Ten percent. Who is that? क्या हो गया भाई? So here's the close this actually. Fourteen percent ladies are there, despite India being a top three of startups. There's so many unicorns. I think maybe it's about hundred and ten. But yeah, I think two more have got added: Light Squid and Fractal. So let's assume between hundred and seven to hundred and ten unicorns are there. Only fourteen percent of Ladies are there in leadership positions in startups. The other interesting phenomena is there is a massive happening from tier one, tier two, tier three cities to actually villages. How many villages are there in India? Sir, tell me. Very serious, Olay. Take a guess. Twenty-one thousand. Number of villages in India. Anyone else? Five lakhs. Okay, close. Who can you help? Who is going on multiples of five? Six lakhs. क्या बात है? Google search मारा. Six lakh villages are there in the country. Good one. What's your name again? Nikul and Mitesh. हाँ ये दोनों के साथ बैठना पड़ेगा. So there are six lakh villages. And 68 percent of the country's youth, 68 percent, are based in villages. There is a fundamental shift happening, where village used to be all about government jobs or agriculture and job security. But people are venturing into experimentation into multiple other careers. So first it was the IT world, where we used to go to coders or coders into villages. Then came the PPO world. And now it's the startup world, which is being built by people from villages for villages itself. For example, there are 1,300 agri tech companies in this country, focusing on agriculture, which is of course bread and butter for people. So here are the numbers for you. I don't know if they're readable itself. And some familiar names are right below. How many do you invest in IPOs for startups? Which ones? Hey, Shavash, Nike, ATM, one ninety-seven kya? Uh, I also did same. Nike, Zomato, ATM, all three. Okay, profit bundle. Not right. Keep a three to five year horizon. Equity, debt, and gold. Okay. Now, having said this, when I talk about innovation, what company comes to your mind? One name, anyone. When you talk about innovation, which do you think is the most innovative company in the world? Paytm. Paytm. Okay. Who else? SpaceX. Apple. Shabash. Or. Microsoft, Google, sorry, Samsung. Anyone else? Tesla. So when we talk about innovation, when we talk about an entrepreneurial culture to keep churning out more products, I don't know if it's visible from here. But take a look. The same Gaza League. Gaza is the only name for Amazon, Facebook, and uh, Apple. Of course, it's, it's changed now. It is. It tends to be called Fang. F A N G. Mm -hmm. 
very interestingly someone mentioned tesla here right how much do you think it spends on r and d and innovation huh? lut jayega bhai non mas itni cars hi bikti hai tesla spends 40% of its revenue back into this so the key part here is innovation is here to stay technology disruption is constant you have to keep pace with it and there are enough startup slash bigger companies that you can emulate and building urban area but when you start here are four simple hacks life hacks that i have learned and which i try and practice first is what i call the walt disney way all of us have ideas with we sitting whether we are on the phone whether we're watching tv ideas keep churning in our mind some activity is always happening and there always a human mind tendency is to keep innovating even though may not realize you are driving traffic management can be done better lane discipline can be done better in school a virtual environment may work out better than a physical environment so you are always churning but how many ideas are actually see the end of light of day and become successful so my first thought is go the world is new way where there are three types of people in one room i don't know whether you deployed that in the discussions that i just now during lunch but in life there are three types of people for innovation the dreamer normally the person who has the ideas the realist the one who is little more grounded and third is a spoiler whose job is always to have these three sets of people for every idea and once you go through multiple rounds of discussion with practicality versus lofty thinking versus hardcore execution versus past failures you will be able to come up with an idea which can stand the test of time so when you get into the market in your school post college in a job or starting your own startup try this method of dream realist and spoil second always remember the future and build a product which has at least a 10 year longevity we normally look at problems which are right here right now and we find solutions and very soon they become obsolete and i read a very beautiful article it's actually a video 3 4 minute video which says stop thinking in years stop thinking in decades think in centuries and millennia because the moment you start thinking thousand years ahead and this is something unheard of people say i have to pass my college i have to get a job let me think about today what will i think thousand years later it is supposed supposed to be known as a true technology disruptor and if you are supposed to be known as a fantastic ancestor from your descendants then you start thinking of innovation that can potentially last for 1000 years the moment you have a long term mindset beyond lifetimes you will always be successful the moment you start thinking short term as to crack a problem for the next one month three months one year the tendency is that you burn out very quickly and the opportunity is lost very very quickly so imagine the future like perhaps what airbnb did perhaps what uber did perhaps what paypal did in terms of digital payments so always look at the future but think of it long term beyond decades preferably into centuries the third is look at the day in the life of the person whom you're going to be putting as a customer so whether it's a consumer like us for uber when it's a driver of the uber whether it's a person who owns an apartment put that person as a central persona and then imagine what you should be doing you will be successful and last is look at collective wisdom of people through crowdsourcing someone mentioned moon lighting here in the room why is why are people moving towards moon lighting apart from the financial constraints they want to learn they want to innovate and perhaps their current job is constricting them to do it you can actively now participate through crowdsourcing so not be employed by one company but still work for multiple companies like me after wipro 
I'm now CX as a service. I advise multiple companies. I'm not employed by one company. So the moment you start doing crowdsourcing and hackathons, the collective wisdom of millions of people comes into play rather than perhaps 300 students of soil that you're so closely with. So four key mantras, if you want to succeed in this disruptive, innovative life, what it is the way, remember the future, imagine the day in the life, and look at collective wisdom through crowdsourcing. I'll take a pause here. This is a brief pause to my presentation. Are there any questions on discussions, on innovation, on AI, or what you can do? Before I hand over the mic to Peter, and then we'll request him to speak uh, his perspective. Anyone? Uh, hello, my name is Satyam. So, uh, as we know, technology has been playing a very vital role. So, do you think technology is going to be a compulsion or a necessity in the coming future? Both depends on what perspective we look at it. If you don't have a mobile phone, you will be compelled to start using a mobile phone. Extreme example. If you are a mobile phone user, then you'll want to increase your device capability and you'll want to move from 4G to 5G to now people are talking about 8G. So depending on what phase of life you're in, you will always be compelled and pushed or you'll be self-motivated to happen. Because if you don't, then within weeks, within months, you'll go into isolation because the amount of knowledge now available is immense and the capability of a human to cope up with that change is very very minimal and we need technology to do that so anyone else give you an example here we are doing an experiment on holistic collective farming in a very remote tribal village in Yavatmal where we have collected about 30, 40 farmers pool their 100 acre land. And these farmers are doing agriculture guided by an expert sitting hundreds of miles away. And the way they are doing it is every day they're able to talk to him, they're able to send a WhatsApp message, they're able to show what is the status of the leaf and therefore what should we be doing. These are tribal farmers who don't know English. Right. This is the way technology is uh, getting integrated into our daily life. You can't even imagine in that absolutely remote tribal village. People have to people use smartphones. It's use smartphones very very effectively. Any other question before we move on to Peter? So how do you look at a human? human side because uh, as the world is going towards tech so the the importance of everything cannot be done using technology so how is that creating a disruption between the human societies like uh, our generation is a bit of social but if we look at the upcoming generation it will uh, the people will not be much social so how do you look at it? you know very interestingly this uh, few years back a nice gaming platform called pubg came I don't know how many of you played it. Battle down. So our son, he must have been in grade 9 or 10. So he said, uh, my friends are coming over to play. I said, fantastic. So they went to the room and the door closed. So I said, they must be talking, chatting, playing. So I just knocked and I entered and I realized all four of them were on their mobile phones. They were playing with each other, PUBG, physically next to each other but connecting with each other virtually. So that's an extreme example of how addicted I shouldn't say, but I'm saying how involved people have become in technology. The fact is that the human consciousness, the human aspiration, the human embodiment always needs, always yearns to do more. And the physical touch, which used to be very high before the fourth industrial revolution is coming down drastically. And people are finding mates and societal interaction through places like the metaverse itself. So the onus becomes on us that when there is fantastic opportunity happening, how do we make sure that the humane side of technology still remains? So you have rules who do repetitive tasks, but it is humane, as explainable, as trustworthy as humans are. 
So our job will become how do we innovate, how do we shape technology, and how do we bring in humane side of it. And if you watch the series Star Trek, where there used to be Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock, I think that's the coexistence that we need to bring in, where Captain Kirk used to be very humane, sometimes irrational thinking through emotions, and Mr. Spock very logical. And both of them were able to coexist. So that's the responsibility back on our shoulders. Whatever emotion we bring in, there should always remain a human side. So we'll uh, switch over to Peter. Thank you so much. I'm anyways here for more questions. But thank you for being a patient audience and thank you for keeping it quick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit, for uh, such a lively session. And I would now like to invite Peter from Japan to share his perspective. Over to you, Peter. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Please, yes? Yes, we can Good. hear you. Wonderful. Congratulations on your conference. I wish I could be there, but uh, since it's not possible, I'm joining you from Shizenkai University in central Tokyo. Um, and I'm going to bring a quite a different perspective on the topic of societal metamorphosis. Uh, but just again, to give you a little bit of background, I've been, I'm from Denmark. I've been based in Japan now for 31 years. And out of those, I've worked 27 years on sustainability. A lot of it with multinationals, how to twinge or calibrate their sustainability strategy. Then I decided at some point, and I'll get back to that, that multinationals would never get us to a sustainable future. It all comes down to leadership. So in 2015, I created this nonprofit called Next Leaders Initiative for Sustainability, trying to connect, inspire, and empower next-gen leaders across the world. We presently have people in 110 countries. And I'm also a professor here at Shizenkan University in Tokyo, working on sustainability and innovation. My slide, the background behind me says the age of X. X stands for transformation or metamorphosis. And we hear so many Xs all the time. There's DX, the digital transformation, which we just heard a lot about. There is EX, the energy transition or transformation. There's GX, the green transformation. And then there is one, at least in Japan, called SX, which is the sustainability transformation. And I guess that's the one I'm going to focus on. I have been working in this field, as I said, for at least 27 years on the topic of sustainability. I'm highly passionate about what I work on, but at the same time, I'm highly data driven. But I don't look at the bits and the bytes flying around. I don't buy into the hype. I look at the mega trends. I look at the big trends. Are they enabling survivability? Are they enabling life? Are they ena enabling thrivability on this blue planet? These data I've been looking at for the last 27 years. And I tell you one thing at the moment, base data are not improving. Base data are deteriorating. That base data that would enable thrivability on Earth are in a pretty bad situation. We just finished COP27, right? You may remember that we're trying to keep the temperature below 1.5 degree warming as compared to before the Industrial Revolution. But in reality, this figure makes no sense whatsoever. I don't know if you know, but warming in the polar regions around the North Pole is four times faster than global average. Warming around the uh, Antarctic regions in the South is three times faster than global average. Last, time, last summer, it rained for the first time in the middle of Greenland with 3,000 meters of ice on top. It rained. Same thing happened on the South Pole. It rained over the middle of the South Pole. Ever, it was not ever registered before. The average temperature, or the temperature last summer on the South Pole was 40 degrees C above average. That is 40, 40 degrees C above average. November 2015, you may know that this was a milestone in human history. We passed 8 billion people on Earth. Presently, we are adding 220,000 people net every day. I know people are starting to talk about a decrease in human population, but there's a long way to go. We're adding 220,000 people net every day. We will go from 8 billion to around 9.7 billion in 2050. And UN is projecting at the moment that global population will peak at 10.4 billion people around 2086. It's a projection. We don't know exactly how it will go, 
but they're pretty good at predicting those kind of things. So we have a long way to go, not only because we're adding another probably 2.4 billion people to human population, also because still, according to a very recent report to the Club of Rome called Earth for All, still about half of global population lives on less than $4 a day. That means below what could, could be called the global middle class. So not only are we adding 2.4 billion people, we're going to add a lot of people who want to be richer and have decent lives. Very natural drive for people. So our challenge, maybe over the next 100 years, and this will depend on your leadership, on your actions, on your decisions, on your heart, before the tech, I promise you. Our choice is how do we enable to create living space for 10 billion people on Earth? I'm not a pessimist as such. I think it can be done. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about at my look of, on the key drivers for this societal metamorphosis towards sustainability or beyond sustainability to thrivability. Because that's where we want to arrive, right? We don't want to just be sustainable. We want everyone on Earth, those 10 billion people, to thrive. That is our aim. So where are we today? Well, amazingly, you know, population growth rate has halved since the 1960s. It's about 1% population growth per year now. It used to be more than 2% in the late 1960s. Great. And it's going further down, sure. But paradoxically, because of the, our headcount has gone up, uh, it has taken almost exactly the same number of years to add 1 billion people to global population in the last 50 years or so. Actually, the last billion, it took 12 years. Let me, oh, sorry, let me get to the numbers. It took 12 year, years to go from five to six billion. It took 12 years to go from six to seven billion. And then it took 11 years only to go from seven to eight billion. So we have not slowed down yet. It's coming, but we have not slowed down yet. We first have a significant hurdle to overcome, and we have exactly four survival bottlenecks to move through. And you will see them play out in India. We have seen them in Pakistan very recently also. There are four survival bottlenecks that we will need to move through with wisdom, with technology, and with three drivers that will, I will mention to you in a second. And the four are all interlinked. We could uh, sort of fail as humanity on any one of them or on a combination of all of them. Those four bottlenecks are, the first one is food slash agriculture slash protein. That would be the first one. The second one is water. The third one is resources and ecosystems. And the fourth one is energy and climate change. And you know these four are all interlinked. But if you look at the base data in those four areas at the moment, it's looking pretty bleak. You also know that India, for example, is facing some pretty tough times when it comes to water supply, for example. The impacts of climate change, the pollution of ecosystems, the degradation of farming land. So while we need to be positive, while we need to look at creating a positive future, we also need to realize where we are today. We cannot just go along with the hype. I used to work with John Nesbitt, the guy who coined the term mega trends, American futurist, very positive about technology, very positive about the future, generally a very positive spirit. But he said to me, always watch out for the hype. When new things pop up, there's such a lot of hype. And most of it, some will stay, but most of it will disappear. We don't have flying cars. We cannot even have autonomous driving. This was supposed to be on the street right now. We're not going to have a lot of people living on Mars. Sorry, Elon Musk. It's not going to happen. Cryptocurrencies? For me, they're a joke. They're also consuming between 120 to 240 billion kilowatt hours of energy right now. This is the same as Argentina or Australia. And the metaverse, well, I don't know. Maybe you want to be in the metaverse, but I would feel sick of living with those goggles on and living in that world all the time. But it's up to you. But don't buy all the hype. Go deeper. Look at the megatrends. Look at the most important things for survivability or thrivability on Earth. And for me, there are three drivers that I've been working with over the last few decades to look at how change happens in society. I call them S 
SVT. Very easy to remember. SVT. S stands for systems. V stands for values. And T stands for technology. Those are the three key drivers of change in our societies. Systems is legislation, it's social systems. It is also business systems or business models. V values is pretty straightforward, but it's also mindset. It's our awareness. It's our worldviews. And T, tools and technology. We need all those three drivers to achieve the kind of change we want to see in society. You could look at it as a three-wheeled buggy, but which one is the front wheel? I would venture that technology is not the front wheel. For me, values are the front wheel because values determine what kind of societal systems we will put in place. If you look at the theater they had at COP27 in Egypt, values were not aligned for a sustainable future. But if we can get the values in place, we will have the right kind of incentives in the economy, and we will have the right kind of disincentivization of some behavior in society based on those values. We might have the right kind of legislation. We might have the phasing out of what is needed to be phased out and the phasing in more rapidly of technologies that we need. Values determine therefore also through the systems, the legislation, what kind of technologies will be promoted and at what speed. Of course, AI, I agree that AI, information technology has a huge role to play. But for me, it's not the key driver. It's an enabler, but we need to work, work based on ethic, ethics, on values, on our heart. That's where the real change that is needed comes from. So um, I would really encourage you to look at, since you are at the School of Inspired Leadership, to think about the role of leadership in this metamorphosis. That's why I personally shifted, although I'm also right now working with multinational corporations and sustainability strategy, I shifted to working with next-gen leaders across the world, trying to empower a generation of decent leaders for whom sustainability is built into their decision-making OS, their operating system. Sustainability meaning acting for ecological soundness, for social justice, for fairness, as the natural thing to do in every decision you take, in every action, basically, you work for in your life or in society. So maybe I don't want to talk for too long. I would love to have a discussion around these issues. Um, so I, I would repeat before I end, first of all, that I'm not against technology. I love Zoom. I love mirror boards. I have a very nice smartphone. I'm not at all against technology. I just think we need to look at the most important things for human beings. And sometimes we need counterbalance to technology. Sometimes we need to be rooted. We need to be grounded. We need to work based on heart and ethics. That's where the real value for human beings comes in. So let me share, sharing us, us, finish my little input here by sharing a slide. I hope you can see it. Is that visible for you? Or not? I just we need can to know. see it. We can you see, can it. see it. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Very good. Very good. So since we're at the School of Inspired Leadership, let me give you at the end my view of conventional leaders compared with what we could call sustainability leaders. You could also call them transformative leaders, if you wish, but with a particular focus on sustainability. So if you look at conventional leaders so far, they tended to see nature as a subsystem of the economy. Therefore, they had a very fragmented worldview. And in language and in actions, it was humanity against nature. If you then look at what I call sustainability leaders, they are leaders who see both the economy and society as part of a larger natural ecosystem. They have a more systemic worldview and they definitely see humanity as part of nature and not above or beyond nature. If you look at the notion of time in most conventional leaders, short-termism is dominant. And there is a lack of deep respect for future generations. There may be some lip service, but they do not show in their actions the deep respect for future generations. 
For sustainability leaders, of course, the short term is also important. For sustainability, we need people to survive. We need people to move up out of poverty. But sustainability leaders do not forget the long-term perspective. And they always have what we call the intergenerational perspective embedded in their thinking. Otherwise, we can run after the short term and completely discount the future. The mindset of leading amongst too many conventional leaders is the alpha male model. You know, the alpha male from a pack of gorillas, right? Might be very useful in the animal world, but we need to evolve beyond that. The alpha male model says it's me leading the pack. Come follow me. The sustainability leader will work on servant leadership. Me supporting others in their journey. This, I think, is very much in the Indian spirit as well. But how much do we see of this servant leadership? Then intelligence. For conventional leaders, rational intelligence is dominant. And I would say emotional intelligence is underdeveloped. For sustainability leaders, there is not any discarding of rational intelligence. There is, I would say, what I call a high balance between rational intelligence and emotional intelligence. Actually, one is not more important than the other. Both are extremely needed to act as leaders with a group of people in your community or in society. Then finally, what is the desired outcome? Well, for conventional leaders, the desired outcome too often is as much as possible now for me and mine. And certainly sustainability is not an embedded goal. It might be an add-on. It might be a piece of lip service, but it is not an embedded goal. For sustainability leaders, though, Taking what is needed today while leaving what is needed for others and for tomorrow means that sustainability is a goal. It is the desired outcome of leading. So I would urge you, as we look at the societal metamorphosis, to think deeply about what future you want and then choose what kind of leaders you want to be. Only you can make the choice. No one can make the choice for you. You can choose the left part uncritically, running along, with the dominant streams in society, or you can choose something that's more along the lines of the right. It's your choice. For me, it's a choice between being what I call a, or having what I call a small self, focusing on me, me, me here and now, or a big self, which is able to expand consciousness, look beyond yourself and look beyond your own time. And with this, I will stop and I hope we can have a lively discussion after this. Thank you. I, I, I would like to share the experience is, uh, with you. Uh, we see so many NGOs, so many government departments, so many agencies working towards eradicating poverty. But do you know how many villages have come out of poverty completely? Any idea? Any, 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 any village that you're aware of that's completely come out of? Very good. Yes. Anything else? Anyone else? Very good. Thank you. So Himla Bajar is for example. We have everybody working, social sector, the health sector, the government, spending millions and billions of rupees. What we find is that if you want to bring about a total transformation, we have to change our approach. And the way Peter said, that this becomes a sustainable leadership. I'll give you an example of a village called Simarkundi in Jharkhand, a tribal village like a typical tribal Indian village, deep in addiction, poverty, very little agriculture because no water being there, everybody going out of the village to earn their livelihood. In three years' time, this village income increased from something like 40,000 rupees to about 10, 12 lakh rupees in three years. And how did this happen? Not by giving them some inputs, but by helping the community come together, sitting together and talking about their issues, 
taking responsibility. A bit of shramdan, what we say as a gift of uh, labor, and a leader who was present there amongst them, but was not leading them, was supporting them. Extend that once they started producing, growing vegetables, and the traders came to their community to say, we'll buy a vegetable from you, but we'll grade it. So A grade will give a higher price, B grade will give 10% less, and C grade will give 10% less. The community together said, sorry, we are not going to sell it to you. Either you buy the whole lot, only then we'll give it to you. So this, this community empowerment happens when there is a sustainable leader there before us. And this is not just for example, that there are examples where 50, 60, 100 villages are likely to be transferred in the next two years in the similar similar approach. So, uh, you know, Peter, this, this brings us to a very interesting question. All this that's happening in this village, of, we are using technology. We are using technology for communication, we are using for so many other things. So how do you see this paradox? On one hand, technology, the you know the, the hype about technology as well as technology can be used in a very what i would say sustainable in a supportive in a developmental way so how do you what would you like to give some observations yeah. on that absolutely absolutely yes uh i used to i used to ghost write for a lot of interesting people including john nesbitt uh, the guy who coined megatrends i also ghost wrote a book for daniel bell a very famous sociologist who's now passed away and we wanted to call, he was the one who wrote a book called The Coming of Post-Industrial Society in the early 1970s. And this was about 20 years later, mid-1990s. And we wanted to write a book called The Future of Technology. And we had discussions. I was ghostwriting. So I was interviewing him. And then I was writing as if I were him. But the funny thing was the book ended talking about ethics and values. Because if you want to tame this horse that technology is and lots a lot of horsepower right we need the horsepower but if you want to tame it if you want to ride it in the right way the way you do that is through ethics and values and that was also his conclusion so if you want a decent future of technology we need to go back to ethics we need to go back to human values and if we can keep that in center and not be carried away all the time then yes we can harness the power of technology in a positive way but sometimes we carry it away, we, we forget the most important things in life and we let technology take over. And then we might end, you know, I don't know if you know this book called Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari. The last chapter is called The Data Religion, I think it's called, where, you know, we are just part of the matrix. Uh, kind of data takes over, it becomes the new religion, and we have to submit to that. And that's not the future I think we should live in. So in this village, uh, when the uh, farmers, they find some pest or something on their crop, they use technology to deliver this public information to the scientists sitting behind, and they use AI, obviously, to identify very quickly how, how these, these things are, are being done. So, you know, and Peter talked about ethics, ethics driving technology and technological change. What's your take on, on this? So how do we how do we use technology in the most effective way so that the basic issues, the, 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 the blocks that Peter talked about, the blocks of food, agriculture, energy, water, and environment, they are taken care of. So good part is that technology has become all pervasive now. Earlier, we thought that it's only available for people in the higher strata of society and those who can afford it. But to every walk of life, to every social and economic strata, technology is available. For example, remote healthcare, remote agriculture, drones for managing your uh, crops in terms of an aerial view. A farmer has built technology and got a mobile solar panel so that you can actually harness the power of solar, appropriately move it from field to field without it getting actually stolen. There are people using technology to build water through water vapor and through 
through the atmosphere. So if you have the right mind, if you have the right applicability, and if you have the right mindset to drive a positive change, everything can happen. The basic issue is that people start taking shortcuts in life. And through the shortcuts, it's faster money, faster deployment, faster success, that people forget the basic fundamental values of humanity. And technology is as you treat it, as you teach it. So the responsibility is back on us that how do you make technology more responsible, more social, more trustworthy? Because after you have two drinks in the pub with your friend, you trust him or her for your till the end of your life. But a machine or a bot, which is actually doing work for you somewhere sitting on the Amazon cloud, you will never trust it. So how do you bring that trust? How do you make sure that whatever principles of life are there are built into this fundamentals of technology? And then how do you monitor and audit it as you're going forward so that there is peace of mind and there are no people raising their voice every now and then saying technology is gone against me. For example, in China, people are using technology to monitor their own citizens. So citizens are now gone up against them, the government itself, because for every human in China, there are eight cameras available. So imagine how much of scrutiny which is happening out there. So there are enough examples of positive. There are enough examples of autocratic behavior. It's for us humans to realize how do we get to technology for good rather than overemphasizing on technology because it's good to have, but forgetting the fundamentals of life. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Ruth. So, uh, are there any questions? I open it to the floor now. So if you have any questions to Peter or David, please feel free. So who would like to go first? Anyone here? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, so I mostly agree with your, uh, your thinking like uh, we make hype of certain tech, like uh, we talk about the cryptocurrency, but uh, mostly it is the blockchain. So we often forgot uh, the uh, technology behind uh, be uh, be uh, behind it. Uh, we also talk about meta, but we forgot that the technology is actually uh, um, uh, augmented reality or virtual reality. So there are multiple applications of our tech, but we only uh, go behind a certain uh, thing. So, uh, as you also uh, mentioned, uh, what a conventional leader should uh, should be, and what a conventional leader is, and what a sustainable leader should be. Uh, but uh, whenever a, a technological innovation or dis, uh, uh, I would say a digital innovation or disruption happens, uh, a conventional leader always looks for the value proposition, and that uh, technology will bring for their internal customers or for their uh, external customers. Uh, what I want to ask is. Uh, is there any framework available for a sustainable leader uh, to use a technology? Like uh, a conventional leader looks for the value proposition, what a sustainable leader should look for? That's a very good question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am. I, I, those three drivers of change they need to hook together. So we cannot do without tools or technologies, um, but. The question is, how do you, what is your uh, operation system? What is your set of ethics or values with which you use the technology? That is the thing. You have to return to that all the time. That's basically, you have to remind yourself to return to those key questions for humanity. Uh, and that, if you do that, I think, of course, yes, sustainability leaders will also harness technology, uh, but they might perhaps not be carried away by the day-to-day, -day, the talk of VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. Sure, it happens, but they dig deeper. I think they dig deeper. They look for the roots. They look for the foundations. And they base their decisions of how to use technology and what technology to use on ethics and values as much as on potential economic gain. I like what Peter Sun talked about SVT, but I think the biggest part of that SVT acronym is V, which is the values. Yep. And simple 
thought process is that whenever you are serving someone and all of us serve someone or the other if it's hr you are serving the employees if you are employees you are serving the customer if you are a ceo you are serving the board so there are everyone is serving someone or the other in the ecosystem your basic fundamental human values have to remain intact whomever you interact with put yourself in that person's shoes and then interact with them so the way you want to be treated a lot of us call up hdfc customer care a lot of us call up airtel customer care and then we realize that we are getting a very raw deal because it's a very impersonal conversation but the same way if you are able to go back to your customer or to your colleague or to your friend and come without values are just it being an information exchange or a transfer then it's not a long term sustainable thing so there are enough value systems there are enough frameworks there are enough ethics books written but my suggestion is that keep your openness to yourself in everything that you do for example if you are studying in class are you giving a 100% are you thinking about the weekend plan that you want to make with friends if you are actually going to meet your parents back home are you spending 100% time thought and energy with them if you are in your job are you giving full eight hours of conscious work there keep these fundamentals in life there are any guidelines and frameworks to support you but if you true to yourself and truly conscious on every action that you take then you don't need any other support system thank you thank you rohit any any other question any anyone else Sure. Ah, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, my question is that uh, technology, technology has constantly changed human behaviors. How do you expect these behaviors to be changed? What was that? I couldn't catch that one. Uh, uh, human behaviors. Someone repeat the question. Maybe I couldn't catch it. I was not able to catch the question. Sorry. No. Yeah. So good afternoon. Uh, my okay. question is that technology gets uh, constantly changed human behaviors. How do you expect uh, this to happen in the future? I've kind of broken sound. I don't know if it's a microphone or what. You want to go first with the softer human aspect of it. I hope you got the question. <laughs> Sorry, was the sound was broken off? I couldn't get it. Okay, you're on mute. Yeah, uh, the maybe question you was. Write this in the chat box. It's easier the because box. the yeah. If that's possible, that would be very nice. If someone could put in the chat box. Sorry, that the sound was broken. I couldn't really catch it. Sorry. Hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is it okay if I take a shot while Peter is uh, getting his thoughts together? Is it okay? Sure, go ahead. So, like I keep referring to the Bhagavad Gita always in most of my sessions. I've only taken a 18-day course, so I'm not an expert on Bhagavad Gita. I don't know the 700 verses. There are three fundamentals resonate extremely well, which I talked about earlier. In Hindi, it's called Gyan, Karm, and Bhakti. And in English, it doesn't do justice. But the literal translation is knowledge, experience, and working and doing it, and connectedness and consciousness. Those are the three things. Sure. In my view, it is going to become tougher for humans to manage all these three tenets of life going forward, because earlier. the balance between what we used to call work life work is also life i don't know why people call it work life balance because they think work is just 8 hours of time gone and the rest 16 hours is what we really enjoy but how do you make sure that the balance among these three tenets is maintained at every point in life is going to become very difficult why in for us is shrinking the dependence on technology is going up dramatically human touch point is coming down dramatically and as technology advances and i like i talked about meta where people go more and more into the virtual shells 
interacting and you should watch this movie called the Tron the Legacy where the entire planet is actually uh, a virtual world and Sam Flynn is a, being a human is in you know misfit out there so the challenge for us will be that we should give into temptation and eat the forbidden apple but resist that and make sure that we give consciously effort into learning rather than becoming a google searcher because there is enough knowledge available on the internet the experience and the applicability of it is missing which is where we have to come into play and to this connected consciousness of people through learning and collective action that must continue because all of us are becoming silent people we spend anywhere for about 4 to 5 hours on a mobile screen and if i add to the laptop plus tv then about 80% of our working or our awake life we are on gadgets and that dependency is going to make us more and more despondent so breaking away the shackles keeping technology as an enabler to enhance human life rather than becoming a slave to it is going to be the biggest challenge for us thank you yeah that's good so no, you mentioned those tenets and i think it's interesting to compare that both the cultures of japan and of india we have this kind of deep wisdom that can that can work as a counterbalance so we just need also sometimes to return to that we need to not forget that sometimes age old wisdom which can work as a very meaningful counterbalance to maybe a technological hype for example and the question which i just got now in the chat was technology is changing human behavior what is the future of it so i guess you mean you mean the future of human behavior and it depends i don't personally i don't think i don't think singularity is going to happen that easy i think singularity i think they mentioned around mid century 2045 i'm not sure i think that's another hype element um but of course further down the road yes there is the risk perhaps that ai could take over there is the risk that we could become just uh we could be run by the data systems etc we would become completely inhumane i would say the risk does exist so how do we how do we counterbalance that is one of the key questions of humanity going forward um and i would say i would like to mention a very interesting book which was written 30 years ago called technopoly it's a combination of technology and monopoly by an american social critic called neil postman a very interesting little book and the subtitle was the surrender of culture to technology and this was written published in 1992 the internet was just coming but he was kind of sounding a bit of an alarm saying we have to counterbalance this drive of technology and what his his kind of prescription in the end was to be a loving resistance fighter that's what he called it a loving resistance fighter so you smile you move forward you use technology when you need it but you also have this spirit of the resistance fighter right you need to keep things in check so um john nesbit the futurist he called it high tech versus high touch he actually wrote a book called high tech high touch and this is a very nice uh kind of an apparent contradiction but we need both at the same time the more we have high tech the more human beings will long for high touch so the paradox is that the more we go for high tech in our daily lives the higher the value will be of human interactions of you know plain love of friendships of the basic elements of humanity and i think we'll rediscover that if we have to have any decent future as a species on earth we need to keep that in mind and we need to rediscover it if we forget it every now and then so our future of yeah well humanity as such will depend on our capability to keep that balance i think thank you thank you peter i would, I would like to uh, uh, bring the discussion to a slightly different uh, plane i would like to ask you you see the most valuable companies for their valuation today are all technology companies okay these technology companies of course are giving building fabulous phenomenal technologies but none of them are directly impacting the four the the, the four blocks that you had mentioned yes now when the company become as valuable as these which is tackling the four uh, four blocks no food agriculture etc right? do, do, do you think uh, that do you see that happening anytime in future and which ones do you think could 
could could be there as valuable companies in this sector. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. I like that one. Um, yeah, you're yeah you're in a way right. I mean, we could have some of the most so-called valuable companies on earth. They could disappear, and I'm sorry, it wouldn't make that much of a difference, not for the survivability of life on earth for sure. So, um, so the question, what is what is value, right? That's also another question. But I think there are some promising. I, uh, although I don't think that we will get to Mars, as Elon Musk would like to like us to do, I still think a company like Tesla does have a role to play. And it's uh, not just a tech company like some of the other tech companies. It works on the shift to electrification. So, And that's certainly a highly valued company as well. We've seen some new food ventures also, like Impossible Foods in the U.S. with very That's a plant-based food, uh, food company, of course with very high valuation. And I think there is a good chance in the future because these bottlenecks will become tighter and tighter over the next few decades, at least, that we will see the next Tesla, the next Impossible Foods in some of those four areas. Um, so I would hope so, because those are the kind of companies, ventures, unicorns that we need to value higher, I think, in the economy. <laughs> Uh, this is Anil Sashtev, uh, the chief servant of soil. Yes. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. I, I just want to ask you a personal question, if, if I may. Yes. You know, you belong to Copenhagen. You studied there. You did your anthropology. Yes. And it was a very unique subject you studied. Then you came to Japan many years later. And you made Japan your home. Mm-hmm. And the social uh, metamorphosis process that we are discussing, you personally experienced uh, some very wonderful experiences and you evolved as a leader. And now you are also very attracted to this whole notion of sustainability and what you do because you follow your heart, you follow your passion. Can you share some, uh, some things about your own personal journey and when you came to Japan and your early education in anthropology and then your understanding Copenhagen into Japan and how you have seen. So you are both an insider yes. and also somebody who came from the outside from uh, Western Europe. So help us yes. to understand this subject through your own lens and your personal experience. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Adi. That's lovely. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, I was, uh, yeah, I came to Japan as a 16 year old, as a high school student. I was just wanting to explore the world. And then I found, um, yeah, I found two interesting things, actually, when I came to Japan. One was that human beings are pretty similar. The things we cry about, the things we laugh about, the things we like in daily life are very, very similar across humanity, really. And at the same time, societies can be hugely different. That was my second. So at the same time, as human beings, we have so many similarities. As societies with societal structures, the values, shared values upon which we build society can be hugely different. So I learned... <clears throat> And the reason I think I got stuck in Japan was because Japan still has a set of very decent values that underpins their technological advancement. It might not always look like that, but Japan still is a very decent country. You have some very fundamental values, human values that are protected and treasured. Some call it conservatism. Certainly there's a part of that in it as well, but it also is a, a counterbalance to maybe the Anglo-Saxon model of economic development. So maybe one of the reasons I started working in Japan, started working on sustainability in Japan was because I thought that a country like Japan, and, and I hope we could include also India in that, have a special role to play in projecting another kind of economic development model. I wouldn't say it has happened, but it could happen. And that's why I think Shizenkai University and SOIL are really important institutions, because we need a peaceful alternative to the dominant kind of Anglo-Saxon economic model of development, which will run down the world if it goes on as it is. So we need to have a peaceful, but still self-confident new model that we can show the world. I think we're not there yet, but one of the reasons why I find Japan fascinating is because this country has the potential to maybe help create this new kind of model. And I think India has as well. So maybe that's why this cross collaboration is so interesting also. So that's just a quick overview. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Rohit, you want to say something in response to that? 
you know, they say that uh, India is going to be driving one fifth of the GDP growth across the world for this decade. They say it's India's decade, India's century. But there are two, three uh, fundamental things of life that if you can remain and, you know, in some sense, India is also the spiritual capital of the world where it draws from the basic human connectedness. One is all of us want to succeed and we look at what we call the unicorn and the decacorn status. But if you fundamentally shift the measurement of success from being a unicorn, which is a billion dollar valuation, to be able to impact billion lives on this planet, that's the first outlook that you can keep. And I think that's one fundamental shift that you should do. Second, this question came about value. In my view, valuation is what others think of you and your company. And that's how your valuation runs into billions and trillions of dollars. But value is what you think of yourself. And that has always to be kept in the highest esteem with the highest respect and you have to nurture yourself. Third is anything and everything that you do, first look within. How we respond, how we react, angry, happiness, high emotions, everything comes from within. So if you want to be su successful in life and you want to live a fantastic and utmost journey in this lifetime, then make sure that you keep yourself strong from within. And as some people call it, you engineer yourself inner so much that nothing from outer can actually affect you. So keep yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and energetically strong so that you keep your value system high despite all the challenges. Those would be my suggestions, what I've learned in life. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Anil. Uh, thank you, Rohit. Uh, and thank you, uh, Peter. We are now going to wrap up this session. And as a part of the wrap up, if you would like to make some few concluding remarks for a minute, 30 seconds to a minute to wrap up uh, the, the day. And then I'll ask Rohit also to share the 30 seconds. And then I'll share 30 seconds. Please. Over to Peter. Some closing comments if you want to make. Yes. No, no, thank you. This was a, a hugely uh, interesting discussion. And um, I think this is one of maybe the key challenges of humanity right now, how we will balance all the nice hardware, all the nice stuff we have out there with the most fundamental sort of elements of what it makes to be a human being. Um, and we have to learn maybe to get back and dig down to those deep values. Otherwise, we might make the wrong choices. And it'll be very difficult to get back again. My biggest worry just to end with is that whether we can change in the direction that we need to change based on the information that we have at hand. So far, we haven't shown our ability to do so. Do we need some large calamity? I mean, a third of Pakistan underwater recently, right, is a calamity. Do we need something even larger scale to change towards sustainability? Or can we learn to act based on the information we have at hand? I think that's one of the key questions that we need to ask ourselves. But this was a hugely interesting conversation and I was very happy to be uh, at your conference. Thank you. I just wanted to thank all of you for, first of all, inviting me. I'm the newest member on the board, but the reason I joined Soil was for the basic values. And of course, I've known Mr. Anil Sashtev since I was a child. <laughs> so the entire philosophy of ethics, strong values, looking out for each other, are these values which will see you throughout your life. Knowledge may come and go, careers may come and go, but the basic principles are there to stay. So in this one year that you stay in this fantastic institute with a difference, as I call it in Hindi, Hatke, make sure you imbibe as much values and then practice it across lifetimes that you are there on planet Earth. And make sure that people around you are happy and the happiness from you comes from within. Thanks once again for inviting me. Right.
Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter Sen. Thank you very much, Rohan. I'm not going to summarize the session because there's so much of information that's been communication, thoughts, ideas that have been shared in this session. It's absolutely mind-boggling. Thank you, Rohit, for bringing along the technology. And thank you, Peter, for bringing us to, uh, you know, bringing us about the thriving leadership. And I think that's, that's the message of thriving leadership is what I'll take with me. Thank you very much. We are extremely thankful to our esteemed panel for such an informative session. We now request Vijay Ma'am to please felicitate uh, Mr. Rohit. We also request ANB sir to please felicitate Yogesh sir. We also thank Mr. Peter for joining us virtually today. Uh, so we'll take a break for 15 minutes and after we'll come back at 4.45 for the next session. Thank you, everyone.
settle down. We can hear you. Thank you. And learning are indispensable to each other. We have witnessed this today. And we hope the journey has been insightful and holistic so far. Today, we have with us Mr. Prashant Tripathi, CEO and Managing Director of Max Life Insurance with over 29 years of industry experience. He's a strong believer of our current action influencing our current future. He's also an active supporter of our small interactions and always keen on hearing new ideas, perspectives, and opinions. He's deeply passionate about people and customer sensitivity. Sir, we would like to invite you for the value trade address. I would request Salman sir to please felicitate Mr. Tripathi. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. I think the subject is about differences, and I can feel a bit of difference between me and people sitting at the back. So there are many chairs empty here, uh, and you may just move forward. Right? There are many chairs empty here. Come sit closer. Okay. How was the day? Good. <clears throat> I, re I really, I really envy you. Let me begin by saying that I envy you. Coming from similar background, many years ago, I went to a good business school. Uh, and uh, I never had an opportunity like this. All I had was sitting in classrooms, learning management accounting, corporate finance. Uh, nobody discussed, talked about differences. That was just too uh, amorphous, out of bound for me. And honestly, I started to learn about these things only after I came to work in, in the industry. Uh, <clears throat> I think the, the bane of a very systematic MBA program is it's so stereotyped, it is so blinkered that you never get a chance uh, to A, get this opportunity to interact with people who have seen the world a little bit more than you have, as well as discuss subjects which in fact matter in life much more than the managerial economics and corporate finance. So that's why I envy you. And many times I mentioned this to, uh, to Anil saying that uh, I perhaps missed the opportunity of studying at SOIT. Uh, if you're wondering which business school I'm talking about, that's I am Bangalore, uh, not a bad one. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Anil, for inviting me. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to come and talk to you and what a subject. What an outstanding subject you've chosen to spend the day on. Uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, uh, perhaps give you some views around differences uh, through the lens of the corporate world. And because I work at Max Life Insurance, that's where I, will, I have worked for close to 16 years. Maybe talk a little bit more about life insurance industry, uh, our employees. Uh, and maybe project the relevance from my own lens. I think this, this subject is, is very real. And we may like it, we don't like it, we hate it, we love it. Differences are going to be there. They will always be there. And uh, let me just throw this word diversity to diversity. Is diversity good or bad? Good? Okay. Which word do you relate diversity with more? Equal or unequal? Is unequal good or bad? Is unequal good? Bad? 
how can a bad be more correlated to good and then you would have heard this word is a zing word called inclusion you hear about the word inclusion is inclusion easy to do or difficult to do difficult to do it requires a lot of efforts actually to include people right so this entire amalgam of inequality diversity inclusion is is a very complex subject it's an extremely complex subject in some ways it's good in some ways not so good it requires efforts to manage uh, somebody needs to work extra hard actually to get there uh, but whether you like it or you don't like it that's how world is right what fun it will be if all of us were exactly the same we look the same we our stature was same our intelligence levels were same our vices were same it will be a very bad world right so perhaps it's god's way to beautify this world that there is diversity in this world and unfortunately uh, the source of diversity is more inequality than equality right i think today i'm going to paint the picture of this diversity uh, from three different lenses uh, working as ceo of a large organization uh, there are three stakeholders that i spend a lot of time analyzing first is no point of guessing employees second is our customers and third is public at large the prospective customers and i would like to speak about this particular subject from all the three lenses <clears throat> i think the easier one is our our own employees right you will you know we are about 22 22 years old and anil knows that we take pride in our culture we take pride in all the contemporary subjects that are possible within the realm of a corporate we do all the funky things and uh, uh you know we have mentors we have guides and we like to really be a good company it's, it's a company which is 18th best places to work in india having said that so the biggest challenges that i face is uh, is driving diversity in our organization you'll be surprised to know that the top 30 people amongst the top 30 people there are only two women employees only two right is time i go to the board i get bashed saying ye kab badhega kya kar raha ho iske liye uh, and i try very hard but that's where the number is <clears throat> it's not as if we are not trying uh, and let me just perhaps spend some time talking about uh, some data points firstly there is a deep divide when it comes to workforce and that divide exists amongst various segments but for the purpose simplicity let's pick up the gender divide it's a very real subject you know sitting here i see a lot of women uh which is a good piece of good news uh if you were to come to max lab insurance this number will be one fourth so if i randomly select employees from max lab insurance make them sit in a room like this you will find 25% women good number bad number good number oh wow okay it depends it depends on what you compare it with right so for example uh 1989 was the year when i went to study engineering at iit kharagpur uh 33 years ago if i were to randomly select this set from the engineering students and make them sit in this room what percentage of women will be there in this room 1 one, 1% right 25 is a good number but let me just throw a few stats to you as per the uh ILO uh only 50% of eligible women in the world are working so if 100 could work only 50 are working balance 50 are not working if i were to take that number for india what is that number what could be that number what percentage of eligible women are working in india Uh, 20 is a closer number 
19.2% of women are working of the total who could work so if the balance 81 were also to work or would become eligible actually to work what will happen to india will india be the same it will be growing faster slower what will happen to india growing faster right if only 50 percent your global average 50 percent of eligible indian women start to work the growth rate from current six or whatever percent will go up to nine percent immediately right that's the impact of women working Agar Itna easy hai, fir hota kyun nahi? Why doesn't it happen? It doesn't happen because of the lack of ability to manage difference. Right? The lack of ability. When you start to go and work in corporate world, you will realize two things very clearly. A, blind spot biases. Not as if somebody wants to do it, but it's like a blind spot. This is how it is. And I'll give you some examples of that. And the other one is lack of effort. Lack of effort. Those two things. Let me just pick up the, the blind spot biases. So a long time ago, I used to be the CFO of the same company. And I had a manager. When I say manager, he was like a VP in the company uh, who used to run financial closing process. And in his team, there were no women. Zero. So I asked him, saying, Aisa kyo hai? that there are no girls in your team. He said, you know, we have to close the books. And we get only four days to close the books. And when that period comes, my team has to work like many a times overnight, 2 a.m., etc. I just can't work with women uh, because I suspect that there will be inflexibility. Right. In my company, when I started to explore uh, what happened once I asked for the data, what happened to women who went on maternity leave and came back? What happened to their uh, performance rating? Right? Performance rating. What happened to the jobs that they had left before going? Because when, you know, women go on maternity leave, somebody else will sing for that role. In many cases, the performance rating, even for illustrious women, was downgraded because they were seen to be not present. Or their jobs, when they came back, they were running helter skelter to figure out what they will do. Right? These are examples of blind spot biases. When I thought about their managers or this guy, were they bad people? No, they are not bad people. They are good people. Did they have any grudges against women? No. It's just that. That's the way corporate world, which is dominated by males, thinks, right? Uh, <clears throat> and hence, when you enter the workforce or a person like me, you have to work doubly hard actually to overcome some of these biases and challenges. Uh, by the way, the 25% number isn't too bad for whosoever. You said 25% number, 26% number is one of the best, actually. The financial services world is only 16%. Only 16% women in the workforce. McKinsey did a research and uh, they found, or it's a global research, for every entry level to first level promotion, women got promoted only 87% of the times than males. So, so low promote, yeah, 87 and by the time women reached the boards, that number became 18%, only 18%. All this happens because of this preconditioning, this, these biases, these differences uh, that people are unable to bridge. And uh, for a progressive organization, hence, inclusion becomes a very hard subject. We have been at it at Max Lab Insurance for a while. You'll be You'll be surprised to know that in the last 10 years, our women percentage has grown 50%, which means about 10 years ago, we were really pathetic. We were average of where the industry is, and we made a lot of progress. But this, at the same time, really finding women 
uh, at very senior levels in the organization continues to be extremely high. And it will take us a few years, maybe decades actually, to bridge this gap. Uh, you know, one is working with the dream, and our dream is uh, over the next two to three years, this number must reach 30%. It sits in the gold sheets of all the top leaders saying, yeah, percentage uh, We have started programs for our women employees. You know, there is a program uh, which is called She Leads. She Leads means for AVPs and VPs, women employees, we provide them specific inputs, mentors, uh, you know, training, support, uh, coaching, et cetera, for them to grow. Uh, there is also a program called Roar Ahead, where we, you know, uh, pick up high potential women employees and, you know, provide them inputs for them to grow again. Uh, we do all this. Uh, despite that, um, you know, there is a long way to go. And by the way, this is the 18th great place to work. So I'm just preparing all of you that when you come to the workforce, uh, please, from your vantage points, be mindful of the blind spots that you carry. Be mindful. Be the kind of managers who will start with these blind spots gone. Because uh, in a few years, you'll be nice and really struggling. Unless you guys start to fix, it will take a long time, actually, uh, for this to happen. And, you know, uh, there's always a perspective. You know, I never heard about these things when I studied. You are hearing because you are in a progressive institute. Uh, I heard about uh, these things when I used to work in G. 10 years or more in my work life, I heard about something called uh, diversity, something called uh, gender equality. I heard 10 years in, in my career. Uh, <clears throat> I think you guys are lucky that you are thinking about, talking about these things right now. Uh, because as we move uh, and as we move along, uh, you guys are going to replace people like me. And there's a lot of responsibility on your head uh, to balance this inequality as you go forward. 45% uh, of our agent advisors are women. We have done a significantly better job. And we are number one in terms of women agent advisors. So that makes our overall mix a little bit better. Uh, but I think someday we'll have to get to 40 to 50%, right? The this is the this is just the employment part. There's another evil part, which is about pay parity. You would have read about it. Have you read? And women employees generally get paid less less than males. Have you read about it? So imagine a situation that the two of you went and got recruited by the same company, and you got paid more than her. It will be pathetic. It will be bizarre, right? Oh, you. I'm assuming that you got paid more. Were you? Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> but but this this is very real. This is quite real, and I make a lot of effort. I mean, you'll be surprised to know that I have, you know, I have MIS where I continue to track whether in the promotion opportunities, the ratio is any different. I mean, we had 100 males and 50 females to get promoted. Is the percentage any different? I'm very happy to share that that percentage is never different in Max Life Insurance. We do a great job. I also do a, a scan on salaries that we're paying. We are, we are not different at all, which is great. However, world at large, this is a big problem. And we, again, it's, I don't know, it is a bias, uh, all center. It is, it, is, it is a bias that exists. But I have seen some real good things that, that are happening. For example, I don't know if you read, uh, the FIFA World Cup, US has done a good job for the first time or whatever. They went to the knockout rounds. The football players in the US, women football players, have uh, done a contract. Uh, which is an equality contract, which means all the FIFA prize money will get distributed equally between the male football players and females, which is a good news, right? That's a fantastic news. Uh, BCCI also is moving that direction. You would have read, some of you would have read. So baby steps, uh, but uh, as things evolve, 
some of these things will have to go away. And when you join the corporate world and when you start to grow, keep an eye on these things. They will start to matter. They are very, very important. So to cut the long story short, I think this theme of inclus inclusion is very real. And unless a corporate is careful, and I won't name this company, by the way, I was surprised because we hired somebody from that company. It's the topmost NBFC in India, topmost number one NBFC in India. Women form only 2% of the workforce. 2%, really bad, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, as, as you come to the corporate world, be mindful and work extra hard to make sure that some of these differences go away. Uh, because the fact remains, diversity means new ideas, means more and more strength, zeal, passion in the organization. And we all have to collectively drive uh, an organization in that direction. So that's really on employees. Let's talk about differences at customer level. The we all love Louis Vuitton, don't we? Louis Vuitton, great brand, right? We love that. Okay, uh, Armani. How many of you own an, an, an Armani suit? Don't, don't, but you do want to own, right? Okay, uh, Gucci, um, big perfume brands, uh, BMW, Mercedes, right? We all love those brands. Audi, love those brands, right? One karta yaar, kab hoga BMW? James Bond ke jaisa hamare pas. <laughs> the unfortunate reality is most of the companies have to work with a very large set of customer segments. Unlike some of these names that I took, which target ultra H and I individuals, right? Our company is one such company. We are in the in the business of insurance. And we can't really decide that we will give insurance. I mean, we can decide, but the, the reality is it's a mass market product. So you end up going to levers, you end up going to Maruti, you end up going to a firm like us, you end up going to Access Bank, ICICA Bank, HDFC Bank, large financial institutions. You will have to work for a very large, large segment, right? That's the reality. And there is very high likelihood that you'll end up in a company which will be serving broader set of customers when you land up in that position just be mindful that you will have to deal with differences your customers are going to be very different very very different. for example in our company there is no one segment that we can ever work with these segments are very very different uh, Every year, like I mentioned to you, Max Life is a very progressive organization. We run two big surveys. One is called IPQ, India Protection Quotient. And the other one is called IRS, India Retirement Study. Those two surveys. India Protection Quotient is a platform where we, every year, we go and we interview many people from different segments to find out how many people have got uh, protection, right? As per the last study, the overall ownership of protection or that quotient that we calculate is only 28%. Only 28% people said that either they know or they own or they are secured with their insurance with respect to protection. It's quite logical that any human being will like his family to be protected if he or she were to die, right? Very logical, right? But still only 28% people confirm and reasonably wealthy, I mean, more than 10 lakhs of income segment, we haven't gone to like smaller villages. Uh, only 28%. Why so? There could be only two reasons that I don't have money and I don't know anything about it, right? Knowledge, everybody has. Money also everybody has, but still people haven't bought. And this, we, I'm talking about top 25 cities. You know, we did that digitally. If I were to start going to a B class or C class city or village, etc., this 28% number will come to 5%. <clears throat> Which means there are reasons beyond just knowledge, awareness, and financial uh, wherewithal 
which start to play the role which could be education which could be of course income level which could be level of propensity to take action which could be family dynamics which could be demography which could be age which could be anything right when you come in the corporate world be prepared to deal with these, these differences these differences become very very important to you deal with uh, i didn't mention about some of the great things that we discovered while doing this retirement study <coughs> 70 to 80 percent people believed that retirement is a good thing 70 to 80 percent apna time over chill maringe beer peenge goa ghumenge etc is the notion right is the, is the notion that every 70 to 80 percent people the second question was how many people have or the money that you've got how long do you think it will last in your retirement how long do you think it will last in retirement about 70 to 80 percent people said that their money will last not more than five years so sabko retire hona lekin paise nahi hai second question is how many of you think that you'll be healthy to enjoy your retirement 90 out of 100 people said that i will be healthy 100 percent or i believe i'll be healthy 90 percent people said second question was okay think you'll be healthy how many of you do any physical activity to be healthy okay that number was 30 percent karna kuch nahi hai lekin healthy rahenge third question which was about emotional emotional well-being becomes very important when people retire who do you think will give you the emotional support that you when you retire 90% people said that I am either sure or I might live with my child when I retire. Second question was, how many of you have parents living with you? 36%, right? Parents ke saath nahi rahte, lekin bachcho saath rehna hai. So, you know, I, I, all I'm trying to highlight is people will have lack of awareness, ill-placed notions, uh, and you know all kind of bizarre things and hence it becomes very very important as an organization it becomes responsibility and you can surprise you know, the most that a year and a half ago no life insurance company no life insurance offer no plan a homemaker can't buy on her own without that because there are two pieces of underwriting system. One is for financial underwriting, the other one is for medical underwriting. Then, if you pass medical underwriting, financial underwriting actually assigns a value to it. Means, life insurance industry, all 24 players assign zero value for homemakers' time. Right? You think a homemaker has zero life value? I personally think that the homemaker has more value to her life than the spouse who may be working. Many of these homemakers are anchors of the family. And you could be a few, very a few years. And we have used a homemaker who assigns a lot of value. Blinded, corporate world blinded. We were the first company actually to come out for homemakers. Now, Companies are copied, and put a homemaker can go on policy bazaar and buy, a, buy something for themselves. It is independent of us. We don't ask for this. If you are a self employed person, and you want to buy a large policy to come here with you. No policy. We came up with this because. It's very, 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 very positive. Their profit. Think about these last segments. Homemaker is perhaps one of the largest segments. Self-employed people are perhaps one of the largest in Nobody is ready to give. Because, you know, maybe bad life, maybe somebody is coming. That's how blinded the corporate world is. And 
you know, the throat, I mean, no issue is when you join the hospital, challenge this business. Look at the diversity of this segment. Sometimes we study uh, some funky things to put up there, there's four uh, market only studies, nine, seven, six, four things. One of them is the uh, So we have we have read on between four things and segmentation we have. That's more from uh, the perspective of marketing yeah, or yeah. But look at it more from the social lens. Look at it more from the sense of inclusivity. Look at it more from the sense of responsibility. Uh, because you like it, you don't like it. It's something that as a bonus corporate. I'm going to come to my last one, which is about people at large. It is about people at large, right? Or everything. This is equation. Education leads to education leads to. Opportunity leads to income, right? But many a times, income leads to ask the poor people or students or children because their income levels are low, they don't have access to food. And about a large majority of us can afford to do this because. <laughs> Otherwise, this cycle of education to opportunity to income is quite bizarre. It can start at any point. It can start at income to education. And that's where it comes to the concept of equity. What is the difference between equity? You know? Equity actually is, and you will hear this in the context of diversity inclusion, which is called for GPI diversity. So, equity actually means uh, that, and you have, have you seen relay race? So, by the time the fourth, they go into 100 meters, by the time the fourth lap starts, the guy who is running. And he is last one in the race. It's not because of him, because his previous three guys gave him a last, right? So that by the time he starts to run, he's already like 30 minutes behind. 30 minutes. Have you watched that? Yeah. And finally, lines up being the last. He may be the best runner, but he really can't cover up for equity is all about. Bringing this guy who is starting last closer to right? changing the starting position. That's what we do. That's where you know, the social elements start to fuse with like the education, books, running, food, food are not for people. The purely debated and I was young like you, but intuition, dogs, things like that. Crux of that is because that who is being given the seat is already running 20, 30 meters behind gods of how the previous runners did. Not at this point. Unless you push your back very close. People are running ahead. We'll always say, yeah, so, but you know, that's, the, that's the philosophy of why is he may like it, he may not like it, but that's the way of handling it. The, the work that has taken place in this country for last six or seven years. With respect to inclusion, especially has been nothing less than a point, right? 
yeah, I mean, I'm not here to tell the government and what to But this area may come for the story. Uh, you name one of the kind of explosion, uh, in terms of banking, credit, insurance. I talk about insurance. There are two or three schemes that are really kind of in panel. There's something called the panel of the people. Which means anybody who pays 400 rupees can get an insurance for two lakhs. No underwriting, just SMS you get. Uh, there is about 100 rupees for that. There is something called utter pension goes here. These are really fantastic things. You know, people in India actually probably don't know about, but those things are available. Really so much so that there is a company, uh, there is uh, an NGO called <laughs> Their job is to go and make people aware of the benefits that the government is providing, charge of things that they are providing, to cover and make it. And despite all this work, we are just tracking this thing. You know, we are having about 68 percent. Growth rate is pretty high, but then not going that smooth. Just to cut the long story short, and I spoke a lot, I think later when you see all of your from within that the right way will have this. In your, in your family, I think as human beings, we must place ourselves to manage these things, to dialogue, to act, and to be prepared to place ourselves to act on the inclusive, more participative, more resolution, resolution oriented, because that's one of the keys to be successful. Not just in the corporate development, but also as the community. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks a lot, Prashant. This is very amazing. A very simple of a rich. You know, I had a good portion of it and said that the party was received. And the team of high level information has been working with for my life, working for the uh, when the project was launched. So from that, you see an amazing journey that you had. And you must shout uh, congratulations on the years in the way you have led this from. Uh, you are a leader who has been at that point for the next uh, very effectively. You just don't have to raise their hands, you don't have to organize this thing and ask them. Is uh, who you are and what you stand for. And I know that we have taken more time than we have planned for the session. We have started a few minutes. But if there is a burning question, one question somebody has, you may ask. Just one burning question. Yes, go ahead. Well, there are lots of questions. I'm stopping it because I know there is a time for everybody. Thank you for being out the time, sir, and for that. I want to make sure that we have so many awards this year. You know, our future is Asia, Palakra, and EP, best year in my land award. Now, coming to the question, there are a lot of resonance in those times. Why do Indian corporates cannot incorporate those dirty programs during May, June, May, or May, two or three years? For any reason, they can come back and do that. We do have a good time. At the end of the day, the part for the government to bear the systems. If the flexible work hours do something for their own responsibility. But the question is quite right. It's something that most companies must do. It has to work. That's one very large and very, very effective, very powerful segment 
and completely generating the that is again because of uh you can remember the blind spot blind spot is Right spot is no such a company. This is a shared office. Why is it not? Everybody should work to grow and uh, work very hard. Is it not? That's the mindset. Okay. I think we will have to break some of this. It took an event like COVID to break the notion of easy office. Right? Absolutely. This is one event. I think. Uh, I think more and more people will have to do that. Yeah. Through the homes, you will see good, good sisters, good mothers, bad nurses. So, good suggestion. We do all right, but uh, I think it's quite a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Those words were really insightful. I'm sure everyone has got about three delegates. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you